Hi, I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble, pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Brian Shortley of Reformation Fellowship, Reformed Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Reformation Forum, the program relating the unchanging truth of Scripture to current day issues. And tonight's subject is indeed a current day issue. We're going to be talking about going on strike. And as this is being taped, of course, we're in the midst of a very uh, well-publicized strike that affects a lot of us right here in mid-Michigan. What does the Bible have to say about going on strike? And tonight we have with us as our guest, John Irwin. John is a seminarian from uh, uh, Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and also serving as intern this summer at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Welcome, John. Good Glad to be to here. have you here on the program. And uh, tonight uh, we're going to be talking about uh, going on strike. And John, m the first question that I'd like to ask you, would you just uh, uh, tell us what is a strike and uh, what is the key issue to understand about strikes? Well, the first thing I think of when I think of strike, being a baseball fan, of course, is when someone swings at a pitch and fails to strike the ball. Well, in a sense, that's kind of what a strike is in labor. You see, a, a strike is when the employer and the workers fail to strike an agreement on a contract. And this brings us to the key issue involved in, in a strike. You see, strikes are all about contracts. And usually when we think of a strike in this country, we think of a, a strike that involves a union. And so a strike occurs when workers represented by this union negotiates the contract with the employer, and then when they fail to come to an agreement, then the workers will vote to leave work and go on strike. And that's what a strike is. It's all about contracts and employment. Wow. Well, Brian, uh, tell us a little bit, what, what is a contract, and does the Bible have anything to say about contracts? How seriously should the Christian take uh, a contract? Well, basically, the Bible talks about uh, covenants, and there are different types of covenants. Of course, there's a covenant between God and man, where you have a superior and an inferior, as the old theologians would speak. And then an, a, a, a contract that regards a company would be between equals, between human beings. And the contract would be something that you have to take very, very seriously because when you agree to a contract, that means you have an obligation to abide by that contract. The Bible says here in Psalm 15, 4b, it says here, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. In other words, if you make an agreement, okay, and you sign that contract, and then down the road you see, well, look, I really don't like this contract I made. I, I don't really think it's fair to me. Uh, you cannot break that contract according to the Bible. If you do, you're a wicked man. So let's say the strike you're having with General Motors right now. Now, we don't know all the facts. I certainly don't know the facts. But let's say, for instance, uh, the people on strike were violating an agreement. They decided that, well, things aren't going the way I like. I'm going to violate the agreement. If that is true, I'm not saying it is. I don't know. But if that is true, then that would be unbiblical. Because if I make an agreement, if I agree to mow your lawn for a dollar a week and I realize, boy, that was a stupid thing. It takes me three hours to mow your lawn. I made an agreement. And if I want to get out of that agreement, then what I have to do is I have to go to that person and I have to say, look, please release me from my vow. Release me from my covenant, my contract. So it's very, very important that you take it very, very seriously. The Bible says we are not the lie. And breaking a contract, a contract is like a solemn vow. It's like a covenant. It's even more serious, in a sense, uh, than just than just uh, promising something, well, actually it's not more serious, but it's more serious in the sense that you should take it as a, as a solemn covenant between two people. Very, very serious. You know, Stephen, as a Christian, am I allowed to breach a contract? Well, Brian, you already referred to, um, uh, to that verse, and he that sweareth to his own herd and changeth not, and I think that really s explains it. But there's really a lot of other things that the Bible says about, uh, about contracts as well. For instance, uh, in Jesus' uh, words in the New Testament where he says, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. And uh, so our yea is to be yea, our nay is to be nay. In other words, we're supposed to uh, keep what we say, even if it's just a simple yes or no. Uh, obviously, there are uh, different degrees of uh, formalities with regard to, uh, to contracts. There would be the simple yes and no. Jesus said, keep that. Above that, there would be a, a, a contract where people would... Uh, agree to, uh, to do certain things and maybe shake hands, uh, maybe another stage where they put it in writing, uh, where they get it notarized, where they uh, may uh, call in a, a lawyer and uh, uh, work out the precise language. And then most important of all would be the vows that we take before God, where uh, the, the Bible tells us, vow 
and pay unto the Lord your God. If you make an agreement with God, he remembers every word and he's going to hold you to it. And uh, you should swear to your own hurt even with God. In other words, uh, keep your, your word, keep those promises that you've made to God over the, over the years. Well, what about, uh, is it ever permissible uh, biblically to breach a contract? In other words, to break a contract that has been entered into. Perhaps uh, it's been entered into uh, with all of the right um, uh, mechanical uh, steps and that sort of thing, but is it ever right to breach a contract? In Numbers chapter 30, and I recommend that you write this down, uh, that you look at the scripture uh, if you're considering this issue because it really has a lot to say about it. Uh, it says uh, in Numbers 30 verse 2, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. In other words, keep your vow, keep your promise. And uh, uh, of course, at a lower level, keep those agreements that you've entered into by way of contract. But then the next verse says, if a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, and her father hear her vow and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand and the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. And I don't have time to read the whole chapter. There are other uh, particular situations that are mentioned uh, uh, with regard to a married woman and, and so forth. But the idea being that uh, a, a young woman living in her father's house, house, if she enters into a contract and her father holds his peace and says, uh, in effect, well, we'll let that go, then she's bound. She must keep her word. But if her father says, over my dead body, we're not gonna, you're not going to do that at all, then she is released from that vow that she's vowed before the Lord. So here we have a, an express scripture example where it's appropriate to break a vow because uh, the, the woman's father, the, uh, the man to whom she is in submission as a, an unmarried woman, says, no, you're, you're not supposed to, uh, to keep that contract. Well, Brian, I think uh, there would be uh, an analogy here with vowing a vow uh, where the Lord would say, in a sense, no, you're not supposed to keep that vow. And obviously, if, we're, if we take a <coughs> vow to, to break one of God's laws, uh, such as if I were to hire a hitman to uh, put away my neighbor because I had some minor uh, disagreement with him, um, and I were to, to vow to pay him a certain amount of money, and he were to vow to, to, to put away my neighbor, and obviously that kind of a vow, now that's an extreme situation, but God would not be honored by my keeping that vow. And, uh, you know, a lot of people use this, you know, I, I made a promise that I was going to do this, and, and of course what they promised to do is totally unbiblical. You know. So the general idea is, yes, we keep our vows, but uh, if we vow to sin, then of course we may not keep them, no matter how much we, we kept uh, the vow. So uh, there was a, a case of this at the time of the Reformation, where uh, uh, what about all of these priests that had uh, taken a vow to... Uh, uh, to, to remain unmarried, a vow of celibacy or a vow of poverty. And, uh, and of course, at that time, uh, uh, it was a lot of thought went into, well, was this a lawful vow or, or not? But anyway, as a Christian, we can breach a contract, but only if we've vowed to sin. You know, exactly. if, we've, if we've vowed to break the Sabbath or vowed to, uh, uh, you know, to, to steal or, or something like that. Well, uh, John... Uh, Contract negotiations are, in our society, done collectively by unions oftentimes. Um, is it okay for a Christian to be a member of a union? I realize this could be a very controversial subject, but we, we, take yes. a stab at it, yes. would you please? Well, interestingly, we don't find the word union in scriptures as a labor organization. However, we do find the concept of representation throughout scriptures. And interestingly, it's, it's really a central theme of the scripture. Brian brought up earlier the idea of covenant and uh, being a, a person interested in Reformed theology and, and believing that it's the truth of God. I understand that uh, the whole idea of covenant is based around representation. And so we can see different places of, of representation in scriptures, the first being in the Old Testament. 
and we see uh, the covenant that God has made with the Israelites. In fact, in Exodus 20, uh, the people here really want a representative before God because they, they feared the awesome power of God before him. In Exodus 20, verses 18 and 19, we read, that when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. They were so afraid of God here and his awesome power and majesty and, and the power of the mountain as they received the Ten Commandments that they wanted Moses to represent them as a people. Well, we also have in the New Testament uh, another idea of covenant, and that's the covenant we have in Christ. We find in Galatians 3, verse 20, uh, talking about Christ as our mediator here, or our representative before God. And we read, a mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. So we have here that Christ represents not just one person, not just himself before God, but he represents all of his people. Mm. And so here we have some uh, prescription already in Scripture for representation for other things. And I think it's no different in employment or in, or in labor. If a union is organized to represent people in the manner it's supposed to do, and, and to do it effectively, and, and not to breach the, the, people, the people's trust of the people who they're representing, then I see nothing wrong with a labor union. However, I would like to note here that discretion is the key. Because if the representative is not representing your interests, or if he is even hinting, as Stephen said earlier, about breaking scripture in this uh, vow you're taking to join the union, then no, you should not be a member. So here, there is precedent for being represented, perhaps being represented in a work atmosphere, but you really have to have discretion on whether or not this union is abiding by your principles in religion and scripture. Why has there been a historical pattern in this country I don't know if it's worldwide, but in this country, a lot of these union leaders are uh, corrupt, uh, wicked men. Some even have ties to the mafia and all that. Uh, do, have you had any thought about that, why that has been the pattern? Well, I think here that you have to deal with uh, power in this sense. Uh, when people represent other people uh, for various things, we see this in our government, that uh, if they fail to look at the people that they're representing rather than themselves or what they think is good, then there's a problem. I think if, if it's a truly a representation, now we can't live up to the representation of Christ, obviously, but if they're truly trying to represent the interests of the people in the union, then I don't see that there's a problem there. Very good. Okay, well, We've, we've uh, talked about the question, is it proper for a Christian to be a member of a union? But what about, Brian, what about a person that just does not want to be a member? I mean, maybe he's conscientiously opposed to joining a union, or maybe he just would rather keep the money and not have union dues and uh, want to represent himself. Uh, can, can he be forced to join a union? Well, uh, legally, technically, he cannot be forced to join a union. The problem is, and I was in this, I was in this exact situation when I used to be a security guard for a large uh, newspaper company that printed uh, newspapers on the east. It wasn't in this area, it was in the east coast. Uh, we had a very corrupt union. We had corrupt union leadership. The, the guy who headed the union basically was demanding that everybody pay him their uh, initial union fees in cash, and he was pocketing the money. It was just totally corrupt. So I said, look, I don't want to join the union. Well, legally I didn't have to join. The problem was at the time I was part-time, I wanted to go full-time. Uh, they would make sure I would never get full-time. They would. Uh, use uh, a little politicking there. And of course, there's very subtle pressure if you don't join the union. Uh, people don't want to eat lunch with you. People will avoid you and so forth. So if you're a Christian, you really do not want to join a certain union. You think it's a corrupt or so forth. Uh, it might be better just to get a different job. Uh, if, you, if you can stand up and fight and all that, and you're willing to fight, and you're willing to be uh, viewed negatively, that's fine. But a lot of times it's wise to get a non-union job if you can. Now, of course, many union jobs today pay so much more money, uh, you know, you might be willing to just put up with some of the negative things that, uh, some of the negative treatment and so forth. But uh, I say, look, if you're in a, if you're thinking about joining a union and you think it's a corrupt union, you think they're wicked men, uh, I would just say just don't join 